Hi, everyone. My name is Lima Roberta Bowie. I'm a Liberian peace activist, a women's rights advocate, 2011 Nobel Peace Prize winner. It has been said that the impact of conflict on women's lives is a reflection of the interaction during peacetime. This simply means the laws, the policies, the practices that we see in our communities in peacetime are exacerbated. Those ones that are negative towards women are exacerbated during wartime. But what we also see as women continue to bear the brunt of conflict is that these same women, like myself, are mobilizing their communities for peace. They are the ones advocating for humanitarian assistance. They are the ones advocating for ceasefire. They are the ones advocating for the cessation of hostilities. Today, we're going to have a conversation with a group of amazing women from the Alliance of Middle East Peace. These women are doing fantastic work in their different communities for peace between Israel and Palestine. We all know that this conflict has been ongoing for decades. And we, I firmly believe that peace can only come in that region with the full inclusion and participation of women from both sides. We're going to have an amazing conversation and we're going to talk about many things. I have a panel of eight fantastic women and I'd like to welcome you all ladies as we have this beautiful conversation. I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, welcome, everyone, welcome. Let me start with Huda. Huda, you are the one who have been kind of like the rebel rouser, trying to bring everything together as part of ALMEP. Let me just ask you, as you tell us briefly, what is ALMEP's vision? And I mean, as we talk women, let's not take out the feminist part. What is the feminist vision for inclusive political strategy as you all seek for peace between Israel and Palestine? Thank you, Lima. It's an honor to be with you on this panel with this amazing group of women that since 2014, I've almost worked with every one of them to move the peace a little bit forward to get women together, to march together. That's my vision, to see women working together in, in order to end this conflict, to stop the uh, pain that we are feeling every day because of the occupation and to have a space for our children to grow up in peace and in harmony. The vision is to have women in every table that has to do with peace and conflict resolution. It's about time for us as Israeli and as Palestinian women to be included in making peace, ending the conflict and bringing a lot of prosperity for our country. Well, Huda, you said it all. The vision is peace for women. And when you in many spaces, when you talk women, you talk feminism, people get offended. Let me ask Amal, Amal, what is what do you think is a feminist strategy for peace between Israel and Palestine? Well, I think women can contribute uh, in a very crucial way to the process because we are coming with our own qualities that men uh, don't have. And when I say men uh, don't have, I don't want them to feel uh, that we are trying to exclude them. The opposite, we are not about exclusion, we are about inclusion, but these qualities were put aside for many, many years. The quality of understanding the holistic approaches, the quality of understanding processes, these qualities men cannot provide to the table. And peace is all about processing. Peace is all about healing the wounds that people had during the conflict. And we really have to look at these things and understand that there is inseparable connection between peace and development. And for us to reach peace, we need to empower people to have a voice, to stand up against oppression. And these things 
are ought to be done through education and education should be the key in the hands of the women because we know how to do it. It's not a slogan, it's facts. Amal says holistic approach. And, and the question is inclusive, in, inclusive political strategy. Sherry, what does that look like for Israel and Palestine? An inclusive political strategy. Well, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you also to Lima and to Huda and all the wonderful women in this panel and in the ground doing the work that we are actually talking about. And I want to continue what Amal was saying. I think whenever we talk about peace process, we need to talk about multi-dimension strategy and processes. And what I would like to achieve in our joint effort is an ecosystem. One that know to work together, develop trust and cooperation and partnership. And I think we can only do it if we commit to inclusiveness and diversity in our work. And by that, I mean, we should dare to touch and discuss issues like privilege, power relationship among ourselves. Uh, acknowledge the difference between women, not just between men and women, but between different women group. Um, and also, I think we need to remove the gatekeeper. I think that often time we use gatekeeper, a gatekeeper, and we are measuring, we use measuring tape to, um, to measure who is feminist enough, who is educated enough, who holds to the right opinion enough, who belongs here and who doesn't. And I think uh, we have to remove those barriers within our own movement, our own actions, in order to make sure that uh, we make room for peace for everyone. Rowan, let me come to you. Removing the gatekeeper recently, Someone said amongst the, in the women's movement, it's time for us to stop holding the mic up for other women to talk, and it's time for us to pass the mic. And so how do you, in, in, in terms of passing the mic onto the younger generation, what is your vision for an inclusive political strategy as a young person within Israel and Palestine? Leima, that's a great question. It's one that I'm always almost screaming at everyone that I talk to. Um, you know, living in Hawada, I experienced my younger brother handcuffed and taken away by the Israeli army. I watched my father break his back working in a settlement just to get food on the table. And every day, every morning and evening in Israel, um, on the Israeli checkpoint, I see myself and I see how it takes away my humanity, my innocence, and my freedom. And then I look at myself, a 25-year-old girl from Hawada, and I also see my cousins uh, married off at 18. You know, I'm part of a society that says I'm not enough without a headscarf and a husband and children, uh, preferably sons. So in this situation where I find myself, I also see the older generation um, of leaders continuing to hold the mic and what I think the future is in terms of getting our power back and our voice back is to find allies. So that's what I do. I speak to everyone um, within the Israeli side, in the US government, in Europe, it's time to speak up and speak truth to power. Um, but I don't think someone will hand me a mic. I'm gonna have to take it uh, with my own power, my own voice. Uh, and just like you said, there was a quote that said, um, it's time to stop being politely angry. I have followed into your shoes and really um, said what needs to be said for both fronts, the Palestinian-Israeli peace front, but also the women's liberation front, because we, as women in the region, were murdered and killed, and both governments don't protect us. Our societies have patriarchal elements in them, and we need liberation too. Thank you, Hamuta. I hope I have your name right. Did I pronounce that right? You pronounced it perfectly. Okay, so there are all of these roadblocks to our involvement. And so you are, we, we, we're having a conversation about a feminist political strategy. How do we get there in the midst of all of the roadblocks, the culture, the tradition, the discrimination? Where, 
what kind of work can we do before we get to that inclusive political strategy? Wow. Wow. That's a great big question. Um, I think Amal said that we have to see the connection between peace and development. I think we also need to talk about the deep connection between peace and equality. And I think that um, the way for us to move forward together, and I very much agree with Shiri, is by acknowledging the differences, acknowledging the different identities, acknowledging our privileges, I say this as a Jewish Israeli woman, understanding that there are differences, but there's something really deep and extremely powerful that connects us all as women, as the bearers of life, as the bearers of hope. And I think what makes me hopeful and optimistic is first of all, all of you amazing women here, um, but also the fact that we were able to do this work together, to cry together, to be angry together, to love each other, to support each other, to take a few minutes and come back and not walk away from the table. And I think that in a nutshell, as long as we remember that we stay around the table and we do this time and time again, and we develop this intersectional feminist toolkit for peace building, because this is what we do. This is what we've been doing. And it, you know, so it will take what it takes. We've, some of us have been doing it for a very long time and we stand on the shoulders of giants who've been doing this even longer than us. And as long as we do not walk away from the table, we do not give up, we create these courageous spaces where we stay together and we support each other and we remind each other just how precious, how precious this partnership is. Thank, thank you so much. And something you said that really struck a chord, there can be no peace without equality. And what we've seen over and over in this region is the ability of a, a male-dominated room trying to negotiate peace. Niven, let me come to you. Did I pronounce that right? Naveen? Uh, yes, you did. It's Naveen. Okay. So, I mean, this whole conversation of inclusiveness, and there is all this conversation about equality, where do you think we can start? Because for us to get to inclusive political strategy, there has to be the recognition that we're equals, you know, equal in everything because God created all of us with blood running through our veins and we have rights and according to the UN convention. So where do we start? How, how do we even start this advocacy across both lines, Israel, Palestine? How do we start the whole conversation about equality? Yeah. So first of all, thank you so much for uh, having me here today. It's such an honor and a privilege to be amongst such women leaders uh, from Palestine and Israel and also from, from Liberia. Um, I think that, first of all, what we, we need to be focusing on is the fact that as women, we have accessibility to our communities as well. This is where the part of inclusiveness comes in. We are representatives also of our families and also of our communities as well. We know their needs. We know what works well, what doesn't work well, and how to actually present those communities. And I think we should get outside of the idea of having one traditional leader who is going to lead and to represent. We need to have leaders that actually, whether they are women or men, but they should be feminists, who are able to come up and, and um, speak on behalf of those communities and have that inclusive uh, voice as well. The other point that I wanted to make, maybe it's, it's, it's this idea that we always need to be recognized. And the question is recognized by whom and why do we need this recognition? While we should be demanding to be on the table and to come up with our own initiative as women, uh, as feminists, to, to have some sort of an initiative prepared, working on it, and then taking it forward to different decision makers. We're not waiting for recognition. We are waiting for action from our side. 
Thank you. I, I, I really do love that. And let me come to you, Fida. 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 Let me come to you, Fida. Um, recognition, accessibility, all of this that um, Naveen talks about is power. Because we all know that power is inherent in the people. And if we are working with communities, we have power. How is it that the power that we possess has never translated into access to political power? And how can we change that? Thank you for the question, and it's, it's a really honor to be here. I believe, uh, as a feminist uh, Palestinian woman who live inside Israel, part of the minority, starting with le leadership in communities is, a, is the basic to take it and continue from that to make a change in the different level. It's important not just to start in communities, it's really important to start with and giving the opportunity for marginalizing community women from uh, uh, women uh, who lead their community we should ask ourselves who are not around this table which voice are, are missing and this is really important and this is the feminist level of uh, uh, bringing uh, that we bring to the peace process it's really important the first level when women will start to be activists and leader in their community the hope and the change, they can see the change, they can feel the hope, it will give them the power, it will change a community. And then we can take it for the next level, the local level, and then the national level, and then the international level. So bringing the opportunity for others, opening door for others, this is the main uh, role that we have as a feminist woman when we are around the table when we are part of the making decision in a different project. Thank you, Fida. Sama, Fida said something, opening doors, creating opportunities for other women. And I, I believe that that is the first step to inclusive political strategy. Yes. What other ways can we, as feminists, begin the process already before we take it to the next level? I think that we have to learn um, to give the voice for the uh, the women who we cannot hear their voices, even in the grassroots movements and, and communities and local communities. Uh, our role as a feminist is to hear, to learn and to be modest, to know the reality of the, you know, the real women around us before we translate and their voices to strategy or we, before we decide to open the door. Maybe they want us to, to send us to that uh, round table and maybe sometimes they, they have to be there, here, there physically and uh, they have to speak uh, behind themselves. So I think that our role is to start with learning, um, uh, recognition, and to be modest, and then to uh, find the next thing that I think it's important to find the similarities and the shared struggle or the shared um, opinions and to, to try to gather uh, women from different issues, from different communities together around the uh, shared goal. And this is um, uh, another strategy that I, I do believe in. Um, um, and it can cross, you know, nationality, religion, and other uh, backgrounds or, uh, you know, um, uh, limitations that borders that usually, you know, um, keep us uh, far from each other. So, so to learn and to to find the shared uh, struggles or to share shared sometimes pain or shared goals, and then. I do believe in, in you know, planning, who's speaking, when we have to be speaking, and then we'll start that, you know, the activism or, or um, you call it open the doors, but I, I call it uh, activism. And, uh, thank, uh, thank you, Sama. I, I, as I listen to all of you, there are many themes that has come out of this conversation. We've had conversations about peace and development, peace and equality, We've had conversations about, we've, I've heard 
humanity, our collective humanity. I've heard about the shared pain, but then also the shared vision. They, 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 I think where we are right now is how do we harness all of this and, and become a force to move forward with? But I'll go to the next question. Before going to the next question, years ago, I've been involved in the Middle East somehow long before even the Nobel. Years ago, I was invited to Egypt where um, the former first lady, Suzanne Mubarak, was trying to start something called the Middle Eastern or the Arab Women Peace, and, Peace Network. And we went to that meeting and it was very interesting for me. I, I still have never been in a room where the power dynamics amongst women was very high at the time. And so there was a recognition that women can bring peace. But sadly, that recognition never really translated. Unfortunately, at that meeting, the Palestinian women were not represented. They did not come because apparently they didn't trust all of the other regions. And I don't know how true that is today. The Israeli women were not invited because, of course, they came from that side. But even in all of the failed processes of trying to put women together, there is one common theme that women are definitely the drivers of peace. What do you think? And I'll start with all of you because I'm looking at the time. What do you all think women between Israel and Palestine can bring to the peace tables in this 21st century, in COVID era, or even post COVID era? What can you bring that can transform this whole peace process from talk shop into actual action. And I'll start with, um, let me start with Naveen and then I'll come to Sama. W what do you think women can bring to the table now that they've never done before that can change the dynamics? Like this is the last minute in a soccer match and you need one strategy for victory. Mm -hmm. What strategies are you all bringing to the table that we can finally breathe and say, we've gotten the victory of peace. Yeah, uh, so that's actually a good question. And um, I think that there are two separate strategies that we need to be utilizing here. One is that we have accessibility to decision makers and, and we have the ability to, um, not have the ability, but maybe the circumstances around us allow us that opportunity to access decision makers and have our voices heard. So that is one strategy that as women, as individuals, taking everything that we hear back from our communities, but also taking that message forward to decision makers and different leaders as well. And the other strategy would be our ability to come together and organize. There are so many issues that hold us together as a community, whether we are Palestinian or Israeli, we both felt loss. We both are, um, have so many things in common, but the thing is, how do we start recognizing each other's experience and building on that experience and narratives towards one, um, one movement that can put pressure on decision makers and come up with our own initiative to peace? Let, let me hear from let me you. Who? Oh. Yes. Samah. Yes, Samah. Samah. <laughs> uh, well, I remember when you was here in, in Neve Shalom Wahd Salam, I remember your speech. And um, the one, you know, important sentence that I remember from that magnificent, amazing speech that was that your impression about the Palestinian and the Israeli woman that we are not ready yet. You say that, and I, I remember that I cried that night. You say that we, we are not ready to sacrifice. We are not ready to handle the pain of this uh, shared struggle that we have. And and I I, I see here Hamutal and Huda that they, they were in that night with us. And I think that you know, many years after, I think five years after, I, I, I do feel that we are not really, you, you were right, you know, we, we don't suffer enough. 
we um, we live still part of us still live in denial about the other people uh, suffering and if, if i want to do something or i dream to to get that vision or shared vision of bringing peace to our region uh, i will start with uh with the recognition and with the denial and with with the you know the knowledge that what we are expecting to have and to to, to be prepared that this is going to be tough and politically and economically the media we have to be prepared for what is going to you know what we have to handle in the next future if we want to change because change is painful and we we have to you know to be empowered inside in order to be ready to the next you know step of struggle and i do believe that what's happened the last few months in with the covid 19 and it's uh, it was really painful for most of the feminists that i know uh, regarding the gender-based violence how if femicide and um, we saw what what's happened economically with for women in in period of crisis but from the other side we say that we saw that most of the barriers and and walls that were like uh, imaginary walls you know were built between us fall apart uh, with this virus uh, mm. we found amazing opportunities as feminists to collaborate and forgetting about all you know, not not forgetting but we can pause you know a lot of things that keep us um, from collaboration before and we did manage to build coalitions, demonstrations, movements, statements, and to work together. So for, for many months during the COVID-19, we did that. So I think that we have to learn the lesson and to, 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 you know, to move forward, to escalate this success or small success and to translate it, not only for, you know, fighting or comparing for, you know, gender-based violence or poverty or, or exclusion of, of women f from, you know, from decision-making everywhere. And, and to learn how to, you know, to lead this um, methods also <coughs> bringing peace to our region. And, and this is the, this is my, you know, dream for the next uh, few years. Thank and you so much. And, and, and you know, one of the things that we tend <clears throat> to, I apologize if I make people feel uncomfortable with what I say. You but, were very honest and we needed that. Yes. One of the things that I've come to realize is that we cannot build peace on falsehood and we can't build peace on pretense. And in most of the different spaces that we all try to function from, and this is not just an Israeli-Palestinian thing, it's even with Liberia, we have to be very honest to say this is the way we want to go. And and um, ha Hamuta, Samar raised some very crucial issues about being able to bond and work together collectively around issues that are seemingly not political, sexual gender-based violence, femicide, and all of these different things. Why are we able to do that? Or how can we translate that kind of mobilization into peace? I just want to say, I actually have a slightly different recollection of my experience of what you said in your amazing speech at Neve Shalom Wahat Salam. What I recall you saying is if you're not serious, if you're not willing to go all the way, if you are not able or ready to keep the hope for pe people when they are unable to keep the hope for themselves, don't even start. And for me, this was this was not only inspiring but it was about you know this moment of truth when we say to ourselves are we serious about this are we you know committed to this with all our might and for me this was yes yes and and it'll take whatever it will take so it's it's interesting that that my experience was this but i think that 
in my experience as a, as a Jewish Israeli who's been doing anti-occupation and peace work for, I don't know, 40 years almost, um, there's the elephant in the room, which is the occupation. It's the elephant in the feminist room. We're able to collaborate around gender-based violence and pain equity and, and health and many other issues, but there comes a point where we hit this huge elephant in the room. And the only way that we can remove the elephant from the room is to acknowledge that it's there and say, there is a huge elephant in this room. It's causing everybody pain. Because you know, when an elephant moves in the room, it steps on foot, it, you know, it's, it's causing mayhem and damage and pain. And I think we need to be honest about this and say, if we are ever to remove this elephant from the room, if we're ever to come together in a really meaningful way, in a way that will create hope for the future, then we must acknowledge this elephant and then we must remove it from the table. And I think, I don't know, I think, I, I, I don't want to speak for anyone else but myself. I'm so ready to do that. I am so ready to look at this elephant in the eyes and say, leave, <laughs> just go. We're, we're ready for some really courageous conversations. I mean, we've all recognized that, and I'm going to go around the room uh, to the, those who have not spoken with this question. So feel free when one person finished to jump in and who that will give you the last question. But let me start from Sherry. We recognize that we have the power, women, to bring peace. Feminists, we have all of the ability to do that. Honestly, as an Israeli or a Palestinian woman, what do you think is needed to get to where you need to get to? From Sherry to Frida to Amal and then to Rawan, who is the young woman here? <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I, I will. Oh, sorry, Fida, you want to start? Sherry first. Sherry first. Oh, okay. okay. Um, I will be a little figurative, and I would say what I think we need is a mirror. Because uh, when I look at this question, what women bring to the table and to peace processes, I think, first of all, women bring courage. When a woman, uh, and especially in a militarized society like Israel and Palestine, stand up to talk about peace or security, the amount of objection, attack, obstacles she faces is enormous. And yet, so many women do. Second, I think women bring care. Most of the women I met in the course of my work over the years acted because they care. They care for their society, their families, their sisters, their country, not for jobs, not for money, not for power, but genuinely to make their society a better place. I think women also bring fle flexibility. Whether mm -hmm. we were born this way or we were brought up this way, women manage to use creative thinking, strategies, cooperation, and partnership. Oftentimes we do it just so we can survive. The reality is so harsh for women across the world that, that we do it, we have to do it. And women are realistic. I know it's kind of like the upside of, oh, women are naive. So no, women are realistic. They are the opposite of naive. Women bear the burden of life on their shoulders, on their bodies and their skin. They know what life really looks like and what it takes and what it asks from us. So women bring reality into the peace process and conflict resolution. They bring the reality into the room and together with that, they bring years of experience, of courage, of care, of creativity, uh, flexibility. And therefore, I want a mirror because the main problem is that we maybe see it, but most of the women that act do not see themselves this way. Do not look in the mirror and see how courageous, creative, smart, realistic, amazing they are. And I think by looking at this mirror, we can very easily see that without women, there will be no peace. Let, let, let me take from you, Peter. Um, I believe and I think that community, the power of group, the power of community, the solidarity that we can 
built together as a feminist woman is the basic for making a change. When you when you build a, a resilient resilience uh, in community, which is really we feel it in the COVID nineteen, very mm -hmm. in the basic of the the level of the community, it will give back the hope. People will see the change. People will listen. Women will listen for each other. Women for, will listen for different narrative for each other. Will understand different identity for each other. And they are this, and we will understand that we have the same problem. Then we can build the power of being together and making a change together. It will start from the basic of the daily life, and then we can take it for the peace process. It's important and not losing the hope in our way. Friendship between women help us not to lose the hope. And friendship between the women will help us to listen. Friendship and with between women and people will, will help us to not leave the table and take care of who is not here and who, who is here. This is the way that I see this is things will change and we have the big change and we will bring the peace. This is how I feel. This is my responsibility in my way in this process to bring the friendship, the listening to others and not losing the hope. This is our responsibility. Thank you, Peter. Amal, and then we'll end with um, Ravon. Yeah. So uh, as, as a indigenous Palestinian women who grow up in one of the unrecognized villages of the Negev, lacking water, electricity, and basic needs, and spending the first 12 years of her life as a shepherd to make a living for her family, and then do all this activism for the last 25 years, I come up with these uh, four uh, lessons learned about us women. And it might not to be night be nice to hear it when we all women but we have to face it one i really juggled with the question uh, uh lima you presented how come all this community work that we have been doing all this year is not translated into political power and i think uh the answer is embedded in these uh, three points one that we have to understand that we don't have to have to agree on 100%. We will never agree on 100%. And if we wait for that, there is no solution for any crisis. If we have 60%, 70%, let's get together and work in this 60%. And believe me, the differences will take care of themselves when we are in the process. The second thing is that just doing ground up power building is not enough. We need to, to change the structural um, uh, aspects of this, um, uh, of this conflict. And um, sometimes we women play the same game as men that's created by them. No, we need to create our game and we need to create the, the new rules. We can't play their game. It's a big failure. We see it when we need to understand that from history nations get liberated politically and then women were pushed back in the kitchen so we need to understand there is no liberation political or social unless the women are getting full acknowledgement and full rights like men and the last point that i really want to make is that we have women to understand that we have a very deep connections at, at women we cannot shift our loyalty every time there is a big bump in Gaza or a big bump in Tel Aviv. We have deep connections, nationality, patriarchy, all this intersectionality are important, but we should know that this deep connection should bring us together. No matter what is happening there, we have to stick to it. We have to stick to it, even if there is a war here or an attack there. We have to stick and not play shifting reality every time we have a meeting. No, I'm not coming to the meeting because something happened in Gaza or something happened in Tel Aviv. If we are real, we have to stick on what we have in common and go with it. Thank, thank you so much, Amal. Let me hear from you. 
my darling. Go on. Um, I think for me, you know, thinking about this incredible room of women and this really rich conversation, um, I think back to my work with New Story Leadership. I run a cooperation program for Israelis and Palestinians in D.C. And almost every time, I am the only woman or the minority in, in a meeting in Congress. I am the only Palestinian, and I'm the only one that's under 30. And so I think, how can we get that political power? And to all of you watching, I'm just going to shift to the audience. I want to say one of the biggest strategies is you are a politician in Congress or in Europe, if you are a politician from my country, Palestine or Israel, then recognize that if we are not in the room, do not support the initiative. If there isn't a Palestinian and an Israeli in the political meeting, it doesn't matter if it's peace building or what, make sure that we're a part of it. And I think there's a huge power in that. And then looking also, you know, within ourselves, I, when I bring, um, Palestinian women from Gaza, from East Jerusalem, from Israel, we place them with congressional women, like Congresswoman AOC or Ilhan Omar. And I remember my girls, like in tears, thinking they care, like people care about my story. And I always have to remind them our personal stories is the political conversation. Our personal stories is the political power that we have. When I go and I speak, people listen because it's real and it's passion and it's motivated. And I think that's a strategy we all need to take within us and bring that into the political table. Um, and with this peace building movement, I look around and I do see that the organizations are majority run by men. And I just think to myself, we need to criticize ourselves openly and think like, who is leading us and why aren't there enough women in it? So Lima, I think I'll end with, um, you know, how can we as a vision just achieve the ordinary joys of life, of walking to school without an army or mandatory service, the ordinary life of building a home without being demolished? That's what I want to get, an ordinary life so that every girl and woman in Palestine and Israel can dream extraordinary goals and not have to first think, how do I get to school every morning without that um, Israeli soldier? Thank you so much. Let me give Amen. the last question to, to Huda and then I will wrap up. Huda, what is the Almep vision for peace between Israel and Palestine? Thank you, Lima. It's a huge question and this is why we're, the Alliance for Middle East Peace is doing this work. Because we, know, we believe in inclusivity. We don't necessarily think that only women can bring peace, but we for sure want to push for more women in the peace building uh, arena. And we want women to speak their truth. And we want them to raise their capacity to be able to, do, to uh, lead the movement in Palestine and in Israel. And as the Alliance for Middle East Peace and as the regional director who worked with these wonderful women on many levels, I promise you that this is going to be the strategy for the Alliance for Middle East Peace. Building the capacity of peace builders in Palestine and Israel in order to change the dynamics of the conflict. And I promise that it will be led by women because we already are doing it. I promise that it will be led by women. Our connection, our collective humanity, development, justice, the future generation. These are all visions that we have for peace in Israel and in Palestine. Coming together as women, and not letting it be about one region or one city, but what touch one woman touch us all. When one bomb drops in Tel Aviv and another drops in Gaza, it touches the core of all of us. Peace is not just about ending the war. It is about our collective humanity. These were all things that came out of this very rich conversation and I want to say thank you all ladies 
for having this beautiful conversation. Let us keep doing what we can do because I know that in our lifetime, we will see peace in Israel and in Palestine. I stand ready to continue working with you all and I'm grateful for the moments and times that you all have allowed me in your space. I learn a lot and I thank you all for your fortitude. It is not about where you come from. It is not about your social status or your religious background. It's about what we share as women. And that shared value as women is what should propel all of us to keep working for peace. Thank you all. It's been a wonderful time. Have a blessed day. Thank you to our audience. Thank you to yeah. all. Thank you to the band. Thank you. Thank you to our mouth. Thank you so much. Thank you to Fida. Thank you to Hamotal. Thank you, Rawan, our young woman. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Bye bye. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And I miss you all. Why? I was going to say, Amal, I miss you so much. I oh miss my you. God. And I, 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 I was looking and I was like, I, oh my I, God. You're so amazing. Amal, <laughs> Amal. 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 We, are, we, are, we, are, we want you with us in this. We want you in <laughs> this. Exactly. <laughs> thank you so much. And we want you to be with us in this. I promise this is going to develop to be the most successive program, successful program of women's leadership in the peace building. And we want you to be part okay. of it. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank I can you. get all Thank of you. Yes, Thank you. Thank you. No problem. Thank, Thank you, James. You Thank, you so Thank, you Thank you so much. Thank you, Huda. Thank you for bringing us together. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everybody.